Huntsman, and then you can work on the second stage from there. But these sort of things, the transition uh, between the area of lift that we can find usable and the area outside that is very much smaller. And because the transition is smaller, we feel it more quickly. And so we will feel our entry into the film, which will, and we have to roll into it more quickly, we have to respond more quickly. <coughs> I just, um, just want to mention this business at the top and the bottom, because it's something I find that, uh, for those of you who are not so experienced, it will take you quite a long time to feel and understand, and those of you who are might already understand it. But the thermal at the top pushes the air away, so you get like a dome. You can see on the top of a big cumulus, that dome that pushes on the top and you get little pilliasmus <coughs> somewhere. And so this area here, the air is generally smooth. Usually in this area, if we come and we thermal here, we'll find that the, uh, the air is quite smooth and we won't get a lot of sensation in the glider, but the lift could be quite good. This area here, the air is being entrained. The air is coming in and it's being drawn in from outside. And it's obvious, yeah, partly because I draw more arrows, but it's obvious that actually it's going to be more turbulent. It's going to be choppy. Yeah. Where, the, where the bubbles come up, I, I always like to talk about being in the kettle. Probably, anybody who's been on one of our team training stuff will talk about, I've got, I'm in the kettle. Yeah. And it's like a kettle of boiling water. There's bubbles coming up all the time. Yeah. And we get into the kettle first, and then we get into the bubble second. And when we come into the bubble here, if, when we enter it, we find that this bumpy, turbulent <coughs> fracture of the air, we're in the bottom of the thermal. Now, actually, if you're a Gold Sea pilot, it makes not one jot of difference. Right? Either you carry on climbing or you don't. If you don't, you bugger off and find another one. Yeah? And if you do, yeah, well, that's great. I have a nice thermal. But in fact, as you get as you're more interested in your performance and your speed, you need to understand the difference because you know that there you're not going to climb much higher. Mm -hmm. You're not going to really improve your rate of climb in the top. You're in the top of the thermal and you've got four knots average. That's what you've got. You know? It's going to stay four knots average and it's smooth. But if you've got a long way to climb, this will slowly come up. Uh, and if you stay in the middle, it will slowly increase over a period of time. So it will get better in the top, but it will go on for a long time. So from that position, you can climb for quite a long time. If you hit it in this part and the thermal's fractured, you may only get a few turns in the lift. And so after a few turns, you know that you will almost certainly have to leave it. Uh, so mentally, you're thinking, of, you're making a plan. You're thinking, mm. Mm, this isn't going to last more than a couple of turns, three or four turns, out, and I'll be out of here. Or I'm not stopping here at all, yeah? because actually I'm not going to get much of a climb out of this. In that centre of the part, it's very important to turn as tightly as you can. Uh, and that depends on you and the glider and the weight and lots of things. Yeah? I, I don't mean aerobatically tight, I mean sensibly tight, so you've got a sensible sink rate. For, for most pilots, 45 degrees is fine, yeah, it's, it's a good angle of bank. Rarely is it necessary to do much more until they're really strong. And then you can't really turn tightly enough. And obviously you can maintain control at a sensible speed. There is uh, one other point about this thermaling, which I think is worth going back to. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the south, aren't we? Which wind direction is best for streeting in UK? I mean, which north do we northwest. 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 Yeah. So why is northwest the best direction for streeting? Long land mass. Long, long, long land track. Yeah. Could be that'll dry the air out, wouldn't it? It's not so much cloud. Why is it better in the northwest than the northeast? America, we don't yeah. get we do get streeting days on these. Northeast can get be very good in. indeed. If it's dry dry toil from the middle area, it can be very good. Can be good, yeah. Mm. <coughs> so th think about something when you're looking for the thermal. Think about what happens to the thermal. There's a cloud forms on the top of the thermal. If you stand on the airfield and a cumulus cloud goes over, it goes from being nice and warm to bloody cold, yeah, to being warm again. So the influence of the cloud shadow is very considerable. Very, very considerable indeed. We know that the air around the thermal 
will have to descend because it will have to feed in. It will have to feed. That's got to come from somewhere, that air. We didn't have a wind before, now we've got a wind. Yeah. I try to visualise the thermal as a vacuum cleaner. And it's going along and it's sucking up all the warm air as it goes. <coughs> so as it's travelling over the ground, it's that's why it goes side to side. Because sometimes it finds there's a nice bit over there, there's a nice bit over there. Yeah, and it's sort of you know, you've watched dust devils, yeah? mm. and they, they move around, they follow the temperature, <coughs> follow the curve on the ground. So the thermal now is moving along and it's got this descending air down the side. The next thermal is most likely going to be formed in the track of the previous one. Because this air here has got quite a lot of inertia and it's caused subsidence and colder air in this area and it warms as it feeds in. So when our thermal is travelling over the ground, it's naturally going to form a line in which the energy, where the air is more buoyant, yeah, and the energy is going to respond better. And it's naturally going to have more <coughs> subsiding air at the side. So it's going <coughs> to encourage the formation of more thermals in its track. That would apply in any wind direction. But when the thermal goes up, it forms a nice cumulus cloud on the top. So if we have a northwesterly wind here, we mostly go gliding in the afternoons, don't we? <laughs> the sun comes up at midday or something. So our cumulus clouds are here, and then the sun is over here, so the shadows fall alongside. So that great, greatly exacerbates this effect, and the, consequently, the warm air is always feeding in from the sun side, and the shadow is creating cold air, which is stopping the thermals forming alongside. So, you, if you're interested in long distance flight, used to be what I liked a lot. You know that first thing in the morning when the sun's still in the southeast, you know, if it's the westerly wind, it's probably going to street okay. If it's a northwesterly wind, it doesn't street very well. It will street, but the streets will break up quickly, and they won't work so well. But the moment the sun's travel round to the right angle and you can see the shadows lining up alongside the clouds, then you get the excellent streeting and you know that the energy line is generally on the upwind side. It's generally on the sun side, yeah, and you, because that's where the air yeah, is coming from. And just try to get your minds working <coughs> along this track about where's the air coming from, what's it look like, what's causing it, how am I going to use it? Yeah. If we, when we're doing our team training, we talk about how do we recognise these different sorts of days, what techniques should we use, yeah? um, are there days when you should do something a little bit different, because there are, and that sort of thing. It makes gliding even more fun than it already is. Because it's actually just fun just staying up, isn't it? Yeah? But it's even more fun when you can use it really well. So next time you're going round and round in the thermal, don't just think about going round and round. Yeah? Think about what sort of thermal it is and where you are in it. Quite important. Are there any questions on this? Can you say a little bit more about the different technique that you use in heavier faster gliders? Yeah. The <coughs> so I start. The radius of turn in a in a glider is based upon two things. One is the angle of bank, the other one is the speed. So you want to turn more or less at the same radius in both gliders. You don't really, all gliders climb in the optimum place in the thermal. And the problem is that the bigger gliders need to fly faster. But also, they, uh, because they're heavier, they have a, a problem with entry into the thermal, which we'll come back to. If you fly a... Um, it's uh, Ventus. How many people here fly Ventus? Not many Ralph friends here, here then. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a tradition in gliding. If you're a Shemp Hearth man, if you're a Cirrus Ventus pilot, yeah, then you tend to fly slowly in the thermals and not quite so much bank. Yeah? Because Ventus will do that. It will fly with good control, lower speed in the thermal with not so much bank. So you can keep the angle band. Even when it's quite heavy, you still look quite good air on control. <coughs> if you fl and the wings are very stiff in those gliders. If you fly ASW20, any ASW20 pilots here? Used to be one of the greatest gliders in the world after the Libel. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it, it's uh, or A29s. 
that mm -hmm. sort of glider, flexi wing gliders, yeah? Flexi wing gliders, sh um, the Schleicher type gliders, don't fly very well slowly. Yeah? Their aileron control is poor, you know, the response rate is poor, so you can't fly them slowly. So if you compare the two gliders in the thermal, the Ventus glider can fly with the same sort of angle of bank as we might have had in a wooden glider, 35 to 40 degrees. He can fly comfortably with that, therefore he can get a low radius of turn because he can fly slowly and he doesn't need so much bank. The other glider needs to fly faster, therefore he needs more bank in the thermal to get the same radius of turn. When the Astia first came into common use in UK, people couldn't make the climb. <coughs> And most people couldn't make the Astia climb because they couldn't, they, they were trying to fly it like a wooden glider. Yeah? And they were trying to fly it at 30 degrees of bank and 40 knots. Yeah? Because it's way back on the drag curve and it's going around like this. And it just wasn't flying efficiently. Yeah? And you say, well, fly it at 48 knots and a little bit more bank. And hey presto, it actually climbs quite well. Yeah? Now, if you're heavy, if you add water to that, you've got to add speed. You've got to add speed if you add water. If you add, if you add weight, you need to add some speed if you were flying optimum to start with. And when you do that, you know that your radius of turn is going to go up. So this comes back to the age-old question, when do I dump my water? Do I dump my water when the thermals drop off? First of all, most people carry too much water for too long and they take too much in the first place. They'd be much better off taking a launch and going flying than messing around all morning and putting barrels of water in. <laughs> um, but having got all that water in, Paul, you can tell I like finally though if I empty. <laughs> I'm in there having a good time while he's still, still working out what, which hose to connect to the road. <laughs> but having got all that water in, you, you then face with this dilemma about how long you carry it. Well, of course, when conditions are good, you carry it. And frankly, in good conditions, you can't fly too heavy if it's good. And you've got a good technique. The technique of carrying, the, or the reason for carrying a lot of water is so that you don't have to climb so much. That's why you're carrying the water. 